This webinar is based off a very interesting conversation I had. I was recently talking to some fellow engineers here at Microchip about a design I was working on. The main problem was that I needed a voltage source that was higher than what the supply to the circuit was. This design was intended to be released shortly and I didn't have time for a complete redo of the circuit. So I needed an innovative solution that minimized component count but effectively solved the problem. An engineer who I really respect told me that I could supply an increased voltage source using what I already had on the board with only a few extra components. Furthermore, since the microcontroller I was using had a comparator and a clock out pin, I could regulate this voltage quite nicely with some minor changes to my firmware. The solution, a capacitive voltage doubler. Now, I'm a fairly new engineer here and needed some guidance through this design. The concept seemed simple enough, but I still needed some information to get me started. We sat down over a cup of coffee and we walked through the following steps. First, we discussed the basic components of what is known as a charge pump. A single voltage supply is used along with a transfer capacitor. Breaking this circuit down into steps, when the voltage is applied to the circuit, a diode becomes forward biased, allowing current to flow, thereby charging the transfer capacitor. The capacitor's voltage will charge to whatever the supply voltage is minus whatever the threshold voltage of the diode was. Now, if a second capacitor and diode are applied to the output of the circuit, the threshold capacitor will still charge same as before through diode 1. This second capacitor would eventually charge to the supply voltage minus the two diode drops. This all seems fairly straightforward, but the output voltage to the circuit is still less than where we started. However, if a pulse train were applied to the negative terminal of the transfer capacitor, an interesting thing happens. We can increase this output voltage dramatically using the charge already existing on the transfer capacitor along with whatever voltage is supplied by the pulse train. In this example, the pulse train has an amplitude equal to our supply voltage. This makes perfect sense considering that later we will be using the clock output pin of a microcontroller to actually generate this signal. So let's break this down. During the low transition of the pulse train, the supply voltage charges both capacitors. When the pulse train goes high or is equal to the supply voltage, the voltage that already exists on the transfer capacitor is added. This will forward bias the diode D2 and therefore start to charge the output capacitor. Both the transfer capacitor and output capacitor will average out to whatever their previous charge was plus half of the amplitude of the pulse train. I bet you can see where this is going. As we continue to apply the pulse train, the voltage across both capacitors will continue to average out with subsequent pulses until an output voltage equal to two times the supply minus two diode drops is reached at the output. Now, you may be saying to yourself, that's great, but how do you find the capacitor values for our circuit? Well, let's take a look at that. If we consider power efficiency, and we should, efficiency improves as impedances of the capacitors are minimal at pump frequency. Using the formula for reactance, we can see that if the capacitance of our network is large, the impedance will decrease. Alternately, the lower the capacitance, the larger the impedance. This tells us that if we keep our capacitor values as large as possible, we will decrease the impedance of our circuit. However, we do need to consider an important factor in all of this. Equivalent series resistance, or ESR is a result of parasitic parameters on components such as lead resistance, terminal losses, etc. The important thing to remember here is that depending on the type of capacitor you are using, impedances will differ over frequency. Looking closer at the capacitor responses, you can see that as the frequency continues to increase, the ESR begins to increase. This seems to indicate that the reactance formula we looked at earlier stops being relevant as the capacitors start responding more like inductors at higher frequencies. Notice also that the larger capacitor, the one millifarad tantalum, does have lower impedances at lower frequencies but is affected earlier than the others at higher frequencies. Bottom line, when choosing capacitors for a circuit, we want them to have as high capacitance as possible without introducing the effects of ESR. We can further calculate our power output by using the equation for energy. One half our transfer capacitor value times the input voltage squared multiplied by the frequency of our pump or the pulse train. 
by manipulating this equation, we can find the value at which our transfer capacitor should be for a particular load, represented by the load resistor on our schematic. As you may remember, if we use a rather large output capacitor, we can minimize our output ripple. Therefore, as a rule of thumb, keep the output capacitor value at about one order of magnitude or 10 times greater than what you calculated your transfer capacitor value to be. Another issue with this design is current draw. What's going to happen is that as current draw increases at the output, the voltage at the output will begin to sag. If we could somehow regulate this voltage at the output to only operate in a certain range, we could ensure a consistent output voltage. We could do this with the addition of some extra components such as a Zener diode or a transistor, but remember that the microcontroller I'm using in my original design has a comparator on board. This allows me to include a regulator that comes with the added bonus of a central processing unit for intelligence. Let's take a look at how we could do this. First, you'll notice that the same components from our basic voltage doubler are still present. Two capacitors, two diodes, and a pulse train that will be supplied by the clock output pin on the microcontroller. This is a common feature that allows the clock signal of our microcontroller to be used by off-chip devices. Notice that a resistor divider network is also incorporated on the output with the voltage divider being sent into the negative reference input to our onboard comparator. Many of the microcontrollers that microchip manufactures will have a 0.6 internal reference voltage. As you may recall, in this configuration, if the voltage on the negative reference drops below the 0.6 volt reference, the comparator will output a logic high that approximates the supply voltage of our microcontroller. On the other hand, if this negative voltage reference rises above the 0.6 volt reference, the comparator's output will drop to a logic low or zero volts. So, if we configure our resistor divider appropriately, we can effectively provide a supply voltage from our comparator output that is regulated based on what the sense voltage is. So let's build this divider network. The easiest way to do this is to use our reference voltage. If the voltage at vSense is at the boundary that determines what the comparator output will be, we pick a resistor value for R2, and then we find the current across it. I'm not going to include values here, but you can see that this is basic Ohm's law to find the current. Now that we know the current across R2, we can figure out what our R1 should be. First, we decide exactly what we want our output voltage to be. We already know what vSense will be, and we know the current that will flow through the divider. Again, using basic Ohm's law, we can calculate our R1 value by dividing the voltage drop across R1 by the current through the divider. 